All right. Hi, this is uh, Trisha Prescott, one of the breast radiologists out at Lakeview. I also work at Regions as well. Um, so today uh, they've asked me to talk about mammograms and screening mammography and what should women be doing as far as screening their breasts for breast cancer. So that will be the focus. There's various kind of topics that tie into this that I'll be touching base on as well. So, um, obviously, one of the main things we'll be talking about screening mammograms and the recommendations and what, how often and when people should be screened. Also, I want to talk a little bit about 3D mammograms. Some of you may have heard, heard about this more or be very familiar with it. And then breast density, that's a new thing, not new, but it's something that's being talked about more these days and what that means for breast cancer detection. So. Um, First, we'll just start off with, you know, screening mammograms, why do we do them, what, what's the benefit of doing them, or goal of doing them. So, um, so the goals of mammography. If we can find breast cancer earlier, when it's a higher likelihood that it can be cured, um, then we can save lives by doing that. And also, the earlier you find it, the treatment is more effective and it's less harmful and it's easier to tolerate um, when it's a smaller, when it's at a smaller size. Um, and so, breast cancer, in order to detect it or for it to be diagnosed, it has to re reach a certain size. And um, the benefit of screening is to find it at a smaller size before you're having any symptoms. So before you feel a lump, um, before you have any symptoms at all. Uh, that we find it at that size, which is a small size usually. Um, so the earlier we find it, it lowers the risk that the breast cancer will have spread anywhere else in the body, which increases the chance of survival and saves lives by doing it that way. So that's kind of the idea of screening, why we screen, to find it early before you have any symptoms when we can have a best chance at curing it. So why does that matter? Why does size matter when we find it? This is just an overview. There's a little diagram of um, the staging of breast cancer and, you know, there's different stages and, you know, they stage each one and they'll give you a stage based on size, based on if it's spread to any other sites, things like that. So, you know, here in this diagram you have stage zero, which um, stage zero is typically is referring to something called DCIS, which just means they see cancerous cells, but they haven't kind of broken out and they don't have a potential to be to spread anywhere else at that point. They're just localized. Um, and then it can turn into an invasive cancer, and that's when you get to stage one, and then based on size and other things, it goes up to different stages that you can see in the chart here. So the stage of the breast cancer does affect the chances of, you know, the long-term survival rate, right, to put it that way. So you can see here these earlier, you know, stage zero is 100 percent. They expect that to be 100 percent survival. Stage one is very good, 98 uh, percent survival rate. Now this, when you start getting into three and four is when it really starts to drop down. Um, so we want to find cancers when they're small, when they're at an earlier stage. So if you take everybody or anybody who has a breast cancer at about one centimeter size, only about um, 10% of those will have spread to the lymph nodes. Now, if you have a breast cancer that's double the size, it's two centimeters, now all of a sudden about 35% of those have spread to the lymph nodes. If you go even larger than that, at four centimeters, about 60% have spread to the lymph nodes. So the size that we find it is very important to, for curing it, essentially. Um, so we want to find it when it's small, and that to do that, it's going to be before you have symptoms, which is why where screening comes into play. So this is just to kind of show why size does matter as far as um, detecting breast cancer. So what what should we do about screening? How often should you do it? When should you do it? It used to be more for straight, for straightforward back in the 90s and early 2000s. It was always it had been start at 40 and do it every year. In about 2009, they started coming out with updated recommendations, and then. And now we have a lot of different experts with different sets of recommendations, which has been confusing to women. Um, so that's a bit unfortunate that there's not a there's not an overall consensus at this point. Um, but I'm going to go through what everybody says about it, what all the different groups are recommending. So here are the people, here are the different groups, medical groups that have guidelines for screening. So there's the American Cancer Society. A lot of people follow that one. It's a pretty big. Uh, big group, um, an important group that has their recommendations. There's the American College of OBGYNs. There's the American College of Radiologists. 
and those are the people interpreting it. And then there's the American Society of Breast Surgeons, so those are the doctors who remove the breast cancers. And then there's NCCN, that's the National Comprehensive Cancer Network. That's an important um, group that pretty much forms guidelines for how we treat cancer. So all of most of the time, anybody undergoing cancer treatment, they take these NCCN um, recommendations. They follow those usually pretty closely. So the NCCN has recommendations as well as far as screening. And then there's the USPSTF, which is, stands for the United States Preventative Services Task Force. Um, and that's a group of doctors that got together and went over all screening, all types of screenings, you know, prostate, things like that, and, and came up with some recommendations as well. So there's a bunch of different groups, and that's why it gets confusing. Um, but we're going to go through what they all say. So when should we start screening? Well, I'm using the acronyms here, the, the abbreviation, so the NCCN and the ACR, that's American College of Radiology, and the the NCCN is kind of that, na whoops, I'm going to go back again to the abbreviations. That's that National Comprehensive Cancer Network. Um, and then you'll see the USPSTF. So there'll be a bunch of abbreviations, but that's what those are for. So um, the ACR and NCCN says start at 40, but women should start at 40. Um, and then the American College of, or ACS is American Cancer Society, excuse me, and the American College of OBGYN say, you should definitely talk to your patients at 40 and say these are the benefits of screening and give them the option and then maybe take family history into consideration as well. But if they decide not to do it at 40, they should definitely start by 45. So that's, it always, the American Cancer Society had always been start at 40. They kind of softened it a little bit to now say, well, talk about it at 40. But if you don't do it, definitely start by 45. And then the United States Preventative Services Task Force, that one had really, that was probably the biggest change. They said, oh, you don't need to start till 50. And that recommendation came out in 2009. Um, and then they did some update in a few years after that as well. But essentially, it started at 50 f um, for that group. So what do you do? You know, you have these three different levels, kind of a two, en two ends. There's one says start at 40, one says 50, and then there's kind of that in-between recommendation. So I will just go over some data. The 40s, you know, this is where it's controversial. What do you do with women in their 40s? And I would argue you save the most lives if you start at 40, and it's the safest thing to do. It's going to, we're going to save the most women from having a death from breast cancer by doing it starting at 40. But just, just some little, um, some data on it. You know, for women ages 40 to 49, one in six of the breast cancers that we find, they're in that age group. So it's not uncommon to have it in the 40s by any means. Um, and then breast cancer, the mortality from breast cancer has been reduced by, mem by the regular, you know, prior to 1990 mammograms, they were recommended, but they weren't, you know, not everybody was doing them quite as uh, regularly, I'll put it that way. But in the 90s, you know, we really, screening really kind of became more uniform. And the breast cancer mortalities have decreased by 40% um, since 1990. And a lot of that is due to screening, and it is also due to improvements in treatments as well. Um, so here's another slide about the 40s. So how common is breast cancer in their 40s? So one in 69, if you take all women, one in 69 will be diagnosed with invasive breast cancer in their 40s. So it's not uncommon by any means. And you can see this age group, or this graph here. So it's going by age, and it's tracking breast cancers. There's two lines. One is invasive breast cancer. That's that darker red. And the other one is invasive plus in situ. Those are the stage zero, where they don't have the potential to spread. Um, so if you look, you know, it's pretty low, obviously, in younger people, essentially zero. And then as you age, you know, it starts to creep up at 30, and then 40 is where the slope of that curve really starts to increase. So around in the 40s is where it's really the incidence of breast cancer really starts to go up. And then it continues to increase in 40s, 50s, 60s, you know, kind of peaks in the late 70s there, and then drops down a little bit, um, but still there's a high risk for breast cancer in, in all older women. But you can see it really starts to increase in 40s. So something to consider when you're thinking, should I start at 40 or 50? Um, it's not uncommon, I'll put it that way, for women in their 40s. So ultimately, I'm going to just go back to the 
40s once more. So when to start, essentially there's not one consensus. People argue different arguments of why you should start at this time or that time. I would say I would say I think women should start at 40 and do it. I'll tell you about frequency in a minute, but I think they should start screening at 40. Um, but there is not a clear consensus with the experts, so it's something to consider. And um, just one comment on family history. Some people think, well, I don't have any family history, so it's fine. But most breast cancers that we find, those women don't have any family history of breast cancer. It's, while a family history can increase your risk, if you don't have a family history, it doesn't mean you are, you know, free and clear of it. It's most of the women we do find with breast cancer don't have any family history at all, so it's common as a population as a whole. Um, so anyhow, when thinking about 40s, I would encourage you to think about starting at 40 um, and just have an understanding of it is less common than somebody, let's say, 50 or 60, but it still happens quite often, sadly, for women in their 40s. So how often should we do this? Um, how often should we have screening mammograms? Again, they just, there's differing in recommendations. So the ACR, again, that's the American College of Radiology and the National Cancer Institute, um, or the Comprehensive Cancer Network, excuse me, they say, and those are, the, those are also the same two organizations that said start at 40. They say start at 40, do it every year. Um, the American Cancer Society and American College of OBGYNs say, if you, they, you know, they were the ones who said you could consider starting at 40, but if you don't start at 40, definitely do it by 55, so or by 45, excuse me. So they are, as far as their frequency, they just kind of started at 45 for their frequency. So it says from 45 to 55, do it every year. And then once you're 55 and older, do it every other year. But, you know, every one to two years, sorry. I, this is confusing a little bit. <laughs> But so basically what they're saying is that when you're young, in the younger ages of screening, in the 40s and early 50s, you should do it every year. And the reason they say that is because younger women tend to get more aggressive cancers as compared to older women. Older women usually get more slower growing cancers. So that's why they said it. But at 55, if you want to, you can go down to every other year or you can keep doing it every year. Um, but they do say that that the 45 to 55 should definitely do it every year because they tend to get faster growing breast cancers um, compared to older women. And then the United States Preventative Services Task Force, that's the organization that says start, you can wait till 50 to start. They say do it every other year. So they have kind of the most, I'd say, lenient recommendations because they start later and they only do it every other year. Um, so that's as far as frequency, what all these experts are saying. And then how long do you do it? Do you do it until a certain age? Do you do it forever? When can you stop screening? Um, some of these medical organizations didn't, don't specify when you should stop. Some of them do. So the ACR, that's the American College of Radiology, says when your life expectancy is less than five years, it, it doesn't make sense to continue screening. Um, and that's, you know, maybe there's other health problems or um, things like that which would decrease your life expectancy. The American Cancer Society says 10 years, so but a similar idea that each person is different, and depending on how healthy you are, may, you know there may be a 92-year-old who's in great shape and doing just fine. Well, then it, it's not unreasonable to keep doing screening mammograms because if she did get a breast cancer, you'd probably want to do something about it. Um, so that's the reasoning behind that. Well, on the other hand, there may be a 70-year-old who's very ill with all these other, you know, cardiac disease or things like that that isn't expected to live very long. And in those women, they may say, oh, you don't need to screen anymore just because of life expectancy. Um, so those are the, the top two, you know, the American College of Radiology and the American Cancer Society. They say it's kind of based on your health as when you should stop. And then the last group, that, again, this is the United States Preventative Services Task Force. They you know, crunched the numbers and based on statistics and things like that said, well, 74 is a is a reasonable time to stop. You don't need to screen beyond 74, which that's kind of taking the population as a whole and life expectancy as a whole and coming up with that number, which I think is, a you know, it's not quite tailored to the individual person. And so, um, you know, there is some guidelines that say stop at 74, just to be aware of that. But the other ones that say, well, let's take each person into consideration and, and how healthy are they, how long are they going to live, things like that. To me, that makes more sense than giving a blanket number because there's a lot of different 74-year-olds. People are in different um, health. 
So does, do these people agree on anything? They do agree on something. They will all agree that if you start at 40 and do it every year, you save the most lives. So that's what I would argue. That's why I would. That's what I suggest to people: start at 40, do it every year. You know, the downsides to mammograms are, you know, they're a little bit uncomfortable. Some women are more sensitive to compression than others, and they're they can cause anxiety. You know, if you have a finding that they need to further evaluate, which we call a callback or, um, you know, something that you need to work up further based on the mammogram that causes stress and anxiety and it's an additional test that we have to do after that. And sometimes women even need to go on and have a biopsy and then we find out everything is fine, you know, so that was what we would call a false positive, meaning we saw something and it turned out to be just fine. That The downsides of that is it's procedures, stress and anxiety. Um, and it can be a cost, you know, for the for whatever we need to do to figure out what's going on. The upside of mammography is if you get a breast cancer, hopefully we find it early when we can cure it. So, you know, it's kind of a risk benefit. And so I would argue saving somebody's life by possibly finding it early is much better than just, than, you know, more important than the stress of it. I'll put it that way. So anyhow, um, this is what everybody does. They can agree on something that we do save the most lives if we do it every year starting at 40. So that's what I would argue, but I also know some people argue other points of view. So hopefully that gave you understanding of the different, the different medical experts and what they say and why they say what they do. But, uh, you know, sadly there's not an overall consensus as far as when to start and how often to do it. But, but if you just think, well, we're going to save the most lives doing it that way, to me, seems like the way to go. Um, so I'm, that's why I'm going to talk about the recommendations. I'm going to go on a little bit to 3D mammograms. Um, those are newer in the last, you know, five to ten years. We've been doing a lot more 3D mammograms. So I'll tell you what that means. So 3D mammogram, it's essentially what they're referring to is something called breast tomosynthesis or digital breast tomosynthesis. And what that means, you know, the standard mammograms were two views of each breast and it's a single picture. What a 3D one does is we, instead of just getting a single picture, we can look at the breast tissue one layer at a time, one millimeter at a time to get, you know, start at the top and focus and then going to go layer by layer down to the, throughout the breast. So it gives us a more detailed look at the breast tissue. So why, what does it help with? So it helps with false negatives. A false negative is uh, a situation where we say the mammogram looks normal and actually there was a, a breast cancer in there that we just couldn't see on the mammogram. That's a false negative. Mammograms are good, but they're not perfect. There are, especially in women with denser breast tissue, they do, some breast cancers can hide in there where you just can't see them on the mammogram. You know, mammograms find most breast cancers, about 85%-ish, um, but they don't find all of them. So this 3D mammograms can decrease those false negatives, um, which is very important. And the other thing is they can decrease false positives. So false positives are those patients that have to come back because we see something on the mammogram and then we look closer and we say, oh, that's just fine. So that's a false positive. Um, and that's, you know, if we can avoid those, that'd be great too. So it, it is a benefit in both regard. So um, the way it decreases false positives is a lot of false positives are due to something called superimposition. That just basically means overlapping breast tissue that makes it look a little brighter, makes it creates an illusion like there could be a mass developing there. But then when you look closer, you see, oh, it's just overlapping breast tissue. 3D mammograms help with that because you can go through the breast layer by layer and you can see, oh, that's just overlapping normal stuff. Um, so that's how it helps in that regard. It can help decrease the false negatives because it can unmask breast cancer. So small breast cancers can hide in dense tissue and you just don't see them on the mammogram. The 3D, if you can go through layer by layer, it's you have a higher chance of being able to identify it that way. It's not perfect, again, 3D definitely helps us, but it still doesn't make mammograms perfect. Women with very dense breast tissue, it can still be tricky to pick them up even with 3D, but it, this helps us. So there's just a picture of the mammogram machine. The 3D mammogram is essentially the same as far as compression as the standard mammogram. It's just that the machine moves while it's taking the images. And there's just a diagram. Here's the breast here at the bottom. And then um, the x-ray tube will move in an arc, and that helps then it recreates this into these 
layer by layer views. So I'm in the interest of time, this is just basically telling you, you similar to the other one, you get the two views, um, but now we can look at it layer by layer. They have newer technology where we, it just, basically what it does is it takes those 3D pictures and it reconstructs it into the standard views that we're used to, and the reason that's beneficial is that it decreases any radiation dose from mammograms. Radiation dose is very small for mammograms, but it's still, it's a little bit of radiation, so anything we can do to re reduce that is good. And I do have a slide here in a bit about radiation from mammograms. But first I'm just have a, some, some cases in here of patients that were screened. This is a, a view, we call this a CC view, it's top-down view of a patient's left breast. Um, and you can see on the left side, this is the standard view. You can see a bright spot. Let me see if I can get my pointer, um, maybe. Sorry, I want to point out to, uh, maybe not. Hold on. All right, I apologize. I don't have my, can't see my tools to point out the area. Well. Okay, I'll just describe it. In the upper part of the screen, and there's another slide that circles it, there's a, a bright spot, kind of the upper part of the image here. And, and on the right-hand side, this is a tomo synthesis or a 3D image where that particular area is in focus. And it jumps out at you a little bit more. I think my next slide will have it circled. Oh, there it is. It's a dark circle. But you can see here on the upper part of the screen on the left image, there's a little dark blue circle around that. That is a little abnormality here. And that's a very small breast cancer. This is just kind of zoomed in on the area. So here's just comparing the standard views from the 3D view. So this is the standard view where everything's overlapping, so you see a lot of white densities in that image. The one on the right, the Tomo one, it kind of takes away some of that extra overlapping stuff and it really just focuses on the abnormality and there's that central bright spot and kind of some linear line bands extending from a, that's a small tumor in the breast, it's very small, but the TOMO, the 3D really helps us find that. And here's the same breast, this is just a side to side picture. The view on the left is a standard mammogram, the view on the right is a selected image from the 3D, those slices I told you. And so the image on the right has that little tumor in focus more, it's in the upper part of the breast, I think. I will zoom in on it here. So there it is there. Um, and you can see on this little box on the right side, there's that central kind of bright spot and then almost looks like a star, like these speculations we call it, extending from it, those little lines extending from it. That's a small breast cancer there. That's an invasive lobular carcinoma. I'm going to jump back just so you can compare again the images. Um, now that you know where it is, it's in the upper part of the breast. Comparing the 2D to the 3D, it really, is it more conspicuous? We can see it better on the 3D slice than we can on the 2D. So just this is trying to illustrate how 3D helps us. Here's the same, the same images we just had, the same breast, and you already know that little bright spot on the top of the screen is a breast cancer, but she actually had two breast cancers in her breast. This other one you really don't see well um, on its own, on the standard views, and so that is here. I get my try my pointer one more time. I don't know why. All right, sorry, my pointer's not working. Anyhow, um, so there's a second breast cancer in this breast, um, and it's my, so I apologize, that circle's so dark. It's on the lower part of the screen. Um, if you can see my marker, it's, here there's a little tiny arrow on the lower part of the screen on the left, and then I'm kind of zooming in. This is the second small focus of cancer. Now this is very subtle on the, on both views, to be honest. It's a tricky one to pick up, but here it is on the side-to-side -side view. Here on the left is the standard mammogram. On the right-hand side is the um, 3D image, and there's gonna be a little spot that we'll focus in on that I think you can see much better on the 3D image. So right in, in there, there should be a little, a dark blue circle around it on this other view. That's a little invasive lobular cancer. Now. I, to me, it pops out much better on these 3D views. I'm going to go back again so you can compare 2D to 3D. Oops. So here's the 2D on the left and the 3D image on the right. It really blends in on that 2D, the standard view, and then on the 3D, it catches your eye a bit more. So it helps us pick up those small, subtle breast cancers. And this is comparing 
2D to 3D, uh, really zoomed in on the area. On that 2D picture, you I don't think anybody could point that out and say that was a breast cancer. But on the Tomo image, you can really see that central kind of has a almost a bean shape there, but with those lines extending from it, the spiculation, or almost looks kind of like a star starburst there. Um, that's so typical for a breast cancer. That's architectural distortion. It pulls on that tissue and causes those linear bands to kind of extend from it. Um, and so it's much better seen on the 3D image. So I'm going to go over radiation dose relatively quickly. But so radiation dose, you know, mammograms or x-ray, it's a very small dose of radiation, but there is some. It's a less dose than, you know, if you fly across the country from, let's say, you go to New York to California, being up in the air that high has more radiation than being down where we are normally. So you actually get more radiation from a flight, cross-country flight, than you do from like a mammogram. So it's a very low dose, um, but it is a little bit. So there's some guidelines. The FDA says each view of the breast should be three or less milligray, it's just a measure of radiation. Um, and so the standard, the standard. Uh, 2D views, you know, they're less than three. They're usually actually about one to one and a half. And then um, if you do a 2D view, the standard view, and then you do a 3D on top of it, that's extra pictures. It's going to be more radiation. So it's about, that would be double, but it's still under that three milligray, per, still under the federal guidelines, FDA guidelines. But with that being said, at least where I practice, we don't do it that way anymore. We use the synthetic 2D view where we don't have to do that second exposure, which basically puts the dose of the 3D mammogram essentially very, very close to what a 2D one was. Um, so the radiation difference is minimal um, between 2D and 3D because we use this extra technology. It's called a synthetic view to limit the dose. So, you know, when we're doing them, it's really, it's really not much different. There's a few exceptions where it can be a little bit higher on really thick breasts, but otherwise the difference between a 2D and a 3D, um, at least how, how we practice, is very, very similar. There's not much difference in radiation dose, so that's great. Um, and then as far as radiation, you know, sometimes we get a lot of questions. Women are worried about radiation from a mammogram, and maybe I'm doing more harm by getting a, a mammogram because of radiation. Well. Breast cancer, is, sadly, it's common. One in eight women will be diagnosed with breast cancer in their lifetime. And so if you take 100,000, this, this slide here, is, there's some stats on it. But So the first point is if you have 100,000 women, um, how many of those women are just going to have uh, develop a breast cancer? Um, to over 200 naturally occurring breast cancers occur per 100,000 women. Um, in their 40s. So if you take women in their 40s and you follow them over, you're going to find over 200 breast cancers. With that being said, now you compare that to radiation. If you took those 100,000 women and you get them screened every year with a mammogram, what's the risk you're exposing to them by the, by doing the mammogram? They, you know, they they use all these algorithms with calculating this out as far as radiation risk, but there is thought that less than six breast cancer or six cancers could be caused by the radiation, which is you know radiation is you don't want a lot of it, and over your lifetime, the more you have, the higher risk it could it could cause cancer radiation. Like I said, mammograms a very very small dose, but it's not it's not nothing. So you know when they do these calculations, they say about it could possibly cause a cancer in six out of a hundred thousand women, but you compare that with two hundred. 200 of them are just going to have breast cancer on their own, so so much more likely to just develop breast cancer. And the thing is, you want to find it early. And so if you're not going to screen at all, that means a significant number aren't going to be found out of those 200 until later, until it may have spread to elsewhere in their body and where it may not be curable anymore. So, you know, everything is risk-benefit. And, you know, which which is which are you going to get the more benefit from and, and less risk? And, and so... I think this argues that you're more benefit to screen and find it early because breast cancer is very common and we want to find it early compared to the risk of radiation, which is very, very low. It's not nothing, but it's very low. So I hope that makes sense. And then this is just another patient. This patient, this is a very, very subtle breast cancer. This woman has dense breast tissue. Um, she had a, her, her 2D mammogram looked just fine on her TOMO. God, I wish I had my pointer. Um, there's a very subtle 
area of architectural distortion. I'm probably not going to see it here on this image without my pointer, so I apologize. I'm going to zoom. Go to the next one because I zoom in on it there. So here on this image, there's this very subtle ar architectural distortion is where the tissue looks like it's being pulled on. 3D mammograms are really good at that. So this patient had this subtle area of, of distortion. It's very hard to pick up even on the 3D. It's a subtle case. This is why it's good to have breast radiologists who read these all the time because they, they um, you know, the more you do, the better you get at it, and then you notice these subtle abnormalities. Um, so this person had this area of architectural distortion. She had it biopsied, and ultimately it was an invasive lobular breast cancer. Here's this, this zoomed in, still very subtle on both views, but the TOMO is really where it kind of caught your eye a little bit more, TOMO being the 3D. So this was an invasive um, lobular breast cancer. I'm just going to click through. This is a side-to-side -side view, very subtle on that view as well. The thing about this one, it was so subtle and so small, but even this tiny little spot had a, it was, had a micromastic micrometastasis into her lymph node, so it was already starting to spread. So even though it was so darn small, it was still spreading to her lymph node. So these are important to find these little subtle cancers. And it was a, luckily it was a micrometastasis, meaning it's a very small area that had involved a lymph node. Um, so we got it early. They can take that out, and she can be treated, and she did very well. But this is just to illustrate why. Finding them early is important, and finding them early can be hard. They can be very subtle. I'm going to skip over that. We don't have too much time because I want to have some time for questions. I'll just quickly go over breast density. Minnesota has a law. If you have dense breast tissue, we have to tell you. The reason that is is because dense tissue can mask things. Um, I'll just skip over this. This is the group from the East Coast that, East Coast that kind of prompted this whole thing of this density law. It started out there in Connecticut, I believe, and now more and more states are doing it. Some people think there's going to be an overall federal law that every state has to do this. Um, and it was, yep, yeah, this kind of a little, it was a woman who got diagnosed with breast cancer who had dense breast tissue who kind of spearheaded this. And, and so now she's um, made a lot of change, I think, for the better. So this is just a website if you want to learn more about breast density. It tells you a little bit more on what you can do and what it means. And so, um, sorry, I'm going kind of fast now just to get to get finished up so we can have questions if there are any. So this is just showing you density. Every time we read a mammogram, we give it density on the far left, not very dense at all. Fat is basically see-through. If those women develop breast cancer, they're much easier to find on a mammogram. That's compared with the far right image. That's extremely dense, all that white tissue. That's normal, dense, glandular tissue. But breast cancers are white. So we're trying to find a needle in a haystack on that dense breast tissue. That's why 3D can help us. 3D is not perfect, but it, it helps us with that. Um, do we have to do anything more for dense breasts? Dense breast, it's normal to have dense breasts. Not everybody does. There's a spectrum of women. About half of women have dense breasts and half of women are more on the average to scattered. A very few number are extremely dense or extremely fatty, so a very few number on the extreme ends of things. Most women find fault somewhere in the middle, but overall around half women are on the denser side. So we just tell those women, be aware of how your breasts feel, any new lumps, we want you to report those to your doctors. Um, there's other ways to look at the breast tissue. There's MRI, ultrasound, something less common called molecular imaging. MRI, we usually some women do get high-risk screening MRI. They usually need to have one of these risk factors, either a significant family history, um, these other mutations, which are less common. You, you know, the guidelines are if you have greater than 20% lifetime risk, then you usually would qualify for screening MRI. There, you would want to see somebody for a formal risk assessment if you think you're at high risk. Usually it's, you know, family history with first-degree relatives, moms, sisters that had premenopausal breast cancer. Things like that, that's when we start thinking about doing these risk assessments. Um, ultrasound, most people in our community only do, usually do diagnostic ultrasound. Screening is a little bit controversial. Screening ultrasound it has some benefits. The downside of it, it has a lot of false positives, meaning it results in more tests that turn out to be fine, which is why most places in our community do not offer screening ultrasound because of that reason. Um, most of us just do diagnostics, so either you have abnormality on your mammogram or you have um, a focal symptom, and then we would do an ultrasound of that area in addition to the mammogram. Any new lumps should have an ultrasound, and, a, and that's new lumps, should have ultrasound and a diagnostic mammogram. So you shouldn't be having a screening mammogram for a new lump. That, that could 
result in us missing something. Because if you have a new lump, we want to ultrasound it too. So this is just kind of the process. I'm not going to focus on that too much because we're getting near the end of time. But just, you know, how we find breast cancer. You either don't have any symptoms and then you go through the screening, or if you do have symptoms, new symptoms, then you don't need to go through the diagnostic process. And then just a summary, you know, it's confusing about when to screen, how often to do it. I suggest starting at 40 and doing it every year because it saves the most lives. Um, 3D mammograms help us find breast cancer. They're a little bit more detailed. And dense tissue is normal, but it does make it a little bit trickier to find breast cancers. The other thing I didn't go into too much, some studies have shown a slightly, a mildly increased risk of breast cancer in women who have dense tissue. Um, so that's just something to be aware of. So that's kind of my whole summary on screening. I think we have a few minutes if there's any questions about any of that. Thank you, Dr. Prescott. That was really helpful. Um, I, as I said before, if you enter, if you have questions, just type them in the chat, and we'll have Dr. Prescott answer those. And I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. do, you do you think the 3D imaging will uh, eventually be used for everyone? I think it may be. It's becoming more and more common, and uh, more and more insurances are covering it for screening. It seems to be the direction we're going, that it's been maybe the new norm at some day. They're doing a huge study right now um, involving, you know, numerous sites all over the country, numerous, all states, they have tons of sites where they're really comparing 3D. I mean, they have a lot of smaller studies that have shown the benefit, but this is a bigger study than has ever been done um, in regard to 3D. So it'll be interesting to see what that shows, but that'll be few you know, years to get the data on that. But yeah. if that, too, confirms what the smaller studies have, then I really think it will be the new norm someday. But, yeah. And then we'll when, see. that's interesting, when they have, uh, somebody has a dense breast tissue, then can they opt to do the 3D? Yep, anybody, they've found, and the studies so far have shown that 3D helps everybody. Even if you have fatty breast tissue, I had one, I almost, was skeptical of them saying it helps the fatty ones until I had a, a patient who, it, she had a fatty breast, she did not have dense tissue at all, and you could not see it and on the regular one, but on the 3D it popped out at you, and that really convinced me that, yep, it does help everybody. I mean, it's just a more detailed look. So it's offered to anybody who wants it. If your insurance doesn't cover, it can be an out-of-pocket cost. Usually it's not too much, you know, usually it's somewhere in ballparking now around $100, but most or more and more insurances are covering it now, so I hope they continue to expand that so women can have it without an out-of-pocket out of cost. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I don't see any questions yet. Do you, okay. Are there any? Any other things? Wait um, one minute for questions. Sure. Sure. I was just. I think I touched on it before. One thing I just tell want to stress to women because this is a common. Uh, not common, but this can happen with women with new lumps if they think, well, my screening mammogram was fine. So at our sites, we ask you, do you have any new lumps? And the reason we do that is because we know sometimes dense tissue can hide things. So if you have a new lump, we want to do the mammogram and we want to ultrasound in case there's something hiding in that area that we're not seeing on the mammogram. So if we don't know about new lumps, it's, um, can, it can be a problem because it could result in us missing a small abnormality. Um, you know, because like I said, mammograms are good, but they're not perfect. So new lumps, tell your doctor about, and you should have a diagnostic evaluation. That's about it. Otherwise, yeah, I consider getting screened at 40 and doing it every year. Okay, that's great. Um, again, I didn't see any questions, so I guess we'll close out for now. And thank you again okay. for yeah, doing you're this. Welcome. And thanks, everyone, for attending. All right. Thank you. Yep. Bye. Bye. -bye.